Testing, testing. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the committee shall come to order. Uh, we are meeting today to consider nine bills. All have been properly noticed and circulated. There are copies available on each side of the dais, along with copies of timely filed amendments. Late amendments have been circulated electronically or will be distributed uh, to the members at the dais. Pursuant to committee rules, other members of the committee may submit uh, written opening statements for the record. I ask members. I ask that members may revise and extend the remarks on the bills to be considered at the markup and have those remarks included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair and pursuant to committee rule 3I and house rule 11, clause two, I announce that I, I may postpone further proceedings today on the question of approving any measure or matter or adopting an amendment on which a recorded vote or that yeas and nays have been ordered. Also, as uh, thank you, and also uh, uh, it's cold in here because uh, something's wrong with the system, and uh, okay, you better believe it. and uh, it's a metaphor. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, it and uh, they're working very diligently to try to fix it. Uh, we'll go. Uh, the item for consideration is H.R. 2642, offered by Representative Kilmer. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands be discharged for further consideration of the legislation, and without objection, they'll be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. I will now recognize uh, Representative Holland to speak to the legislation. Ms. Thank Holland? you. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in support of the Wild Olympics Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers Act introduced by my friend and colleague, Representative Derek Kilmer of Washington. The Olympic Peninsula is home to a national park, a national forest, nearly 100 miles of wild coastline, 
Indian reservations, dozens of magnificent rivers, critical wildlife habitat, and a healthy economy that balances fishing, logging, and recreation. H.R. 2642 would desi designate approximately 132,000 acres of public land in the region as wilderness and add 460 miles to the National Wild and Scenic River System. The Wild Olympics Act is supported by a broad and diverse coalition of stakeholders that includes more than 800 local elected officials, businesses, clean water, wildlife, and recreation advocates that have come together in support of the expanded protections under this bill. This bill has also earned the support of several sovereign tribal nations, including the Quinault, the Quillette, the Elwha, and Jamestown Sklalem tribes. In 1897, President Grover Cle Cleveland designated the Olympic Forest Reserve to protect the area's disappearing forests from overlogging. And in 1909, President Roosevelt used the Antiquities Act to designate a part of the reserve as Mount Olympus National Monument, which Congress eventually designated as Olympic National Park. Like the Tongass National Forest to the north, this area is temperate, old-growth rainforest, a critical ecosystem to protect in our fight against climate change. This bill helps restore healthy forests important for climate, clean water, salmon, and other wildlife while supporting the growth of sustainable local economies. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, before we consider amendment, just uh, any, any amendments, could, does any other member wish to be uh, recognized in the bill? Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, regretfully, I oppose the legislation before us, which is H.R. 2642. It's been offered by my friend, Congressman Kilmer from Washington, which would designate 126,500 acres of new wilderness and 464 miles of rivers as wild and scenic rivers. The state of Washington is beautiful, and I totally understand why people who live there want to uh, protect that natural beauty and uh, try to preserve those landscapes for future generations. But I believe this bill goes far beyond that and it sacrifices conservation and the local economy for the, the sake of, of trying to preserve something that, uh, as I've stated before, you can't really preserve a, a living dynamic organism like a forest. Uh, we need to do practical conservation on these areas. Local leaders and stakeholders have voiced concern over the struggling timber industry, the rural economy that relies on these public lands, as well as legitimate wildfire concerns associated with wilderness areas. Uh, despite claims that local concerns have been addressed, the city councils of Aberdeen and Cosmopolis, which are both situated near the designations, as well as the Gray Harbor County Commission, have all opposed this legislation since it was first introduced. In addition to the local concerns, the Forest Service in a June hearing before this committee noted that this bill presents many challenges and is inconsistent with previous designations and existing land uses. Both wild and scenic river and wilderness designations must be carefully applied. They are reserved for our most unique and critical landscapes due to their highly restrictive limitations. Sound policy making reconsiders existing uses of the land, including wildfire risk, public access challenges, and economic concerns raised by local stakeholders. This bill does none of these things. Instead, it would further expand the Olympic National Forest large backlog in forest health and restoration work. At present, only 3% of annual growth is being harvested and only 13% of the timber volume that dies each year. Increasing responsible timber harvest, even nominally, would not only improve forest health and resiliency, but would also provide much needed economic growth and jobs for these rural communities. Finally, despite continued protests from Washington State DNR, the proposed wild and scenic river designations include state trust lands managed by the Washington DNR, which is required by law to manage the lands for sustainable timber harvest to generate revenue for trust beneficiaries. This bill regrettably does not address this issue and many others. Instead, the bill offers a deeply ideological approach that does not achieve the level of balance of consensus that it propon its proponents claim, and certainly not the level that a bill of this magnitude warrants. 
Public lands decisions should be made with local collaboration and input. They have real consequences for communities on the ground who live with the consequences of these significant federal land management decisions. This bill is sadly uh, an unbalanced offering uh, being pushed through our committee and uh, it's unfortunate trend that I would like to encourage my friends in the majority to reconsider. It's for these reasons that I invert, uh, encourage my colleagues to vote no. I yield back. Thank you. Any other members wish to be recognized before uh, we begin the amendment process? Uh, see no one. Uh, without objection, the ANS offered by myself is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Uh, Representative Westerman, you have the first amendment designated as number one, and you're recognized, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and as I said earlier, uh, talking about the Washington State Trust Lands, this amendment would exclude Washington State Trust Lands from the designated wild and scenic river segments. Uh, Washington State Trust Lands, as the name implies, are managed for harvest, benefiting rural Washington. These lands fund schools, hospitals, state universities, and more. Applying just a quarter mile buffer onto the proposed wild and scenic river designations would remove over 4,000 acres from state production, further impacting struggling rural counties with the state of Washington. Uh, take a look at some of the counties surrounding this proposed legislation. Between 19 to 28 percent of all uh, Clallam and Mason County residents live in poverty. 16 to 19 percent of Grays Harbor County residents live in poverty and 13 to 16 percent of Jefferson County residents live in poverty. These poverty rates are at least double the rates in Washington's urban counties. Let's not continue to kick these counties while they're down. If this bill is our uh, already going to hamper the timber industry in these poor counties, we should at least uh, preserve the savings accounts for their schools uh, and their roads. And I encourage a support of this amendment and yield back. Any uh, further discussion? Ms. Holland, you recognize? Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in opposition to this amendment. Today, less than one quarter of 1% 1 of the nation's rivers are protected by the National Wild and Scenic River System. This amendment would undercut efforts to protect contiguous free-flowing rivers by removing river segments near lands managed by the Washington State Department of Natural Resources. The National Park Service has a long history of working with states to provide for the management of wild and scenic rivers crossing non-federal lands. Commonly known as partnership rivers, these segments would allow the Washington State DNR to, ret to retain decision-making authority while allowing the National Park Service to provide technical assistance regarding management. Most importantly, wild and scenic designations on non-federal land do not transfer ownership to the federal government. The state continues to have jurisdiction to manage state lands and to determine appropriate land use regulations. As I mentioned earlier, Wild Olympics Act enjoys the support of hundreds of stakeholders, including tribes, local elected officials, businesses, sportsmen, conservationists, and many others. This amendment is inconsistent with the intent of the designations and the wishes of those supportive of this bill. I urge opposition to this amendment, and I yield back. General Lady Yields, uh, any other member? Uh one further discussion on the amendment? Hearing no further debate, the question is on the Westerman Amendment number one to the ANS. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The noes have it, and the amendment is, uh, gentlemen re uh, request a recorded vote. Uh, and the vote will be postponed pursuant to the prior announcement. Uh, Representative Westerman, you have the next amendment designated as number two. You are recognized, sir, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I have an amendment that I think would make the, uh, the underlying bill uh, much better. This amendment would uh, strike the designation of potential wilderness, which um, I believe is a very vague term. It would make a sweeping designation of approximately 5,000 acres of potential wilderness, which the Secretary of Agriculture can later formally designate as wilderness. Uh, not only is this vague and ambiguous, 
It is also uh, creates an opportunity that I think will cause confusion down the road. There are 5,000 acres at issue here that are situated largely near roads, and, and we know how this works, uh, roads that proponents of the bill are hoping to close and include large amounts of previously harvested stands uh, along these roads. Merely locking up vast swaths of land is no way to manage federal land. Instead, we should be investing in sustainable, proactive measures that balance both resource stewardship and local input. This amendment would remove some of the ambiguity surrounding wilderness designation and allow the local community to continue benefiting from roads and land in the area. I yield back. Gentleman yields. Anyone uh, else wish to uh, have discussion? Ms. Holland? Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in opposition to this amendment, which would prevent the designation of 5,346 acres of wilderness. As I mentioned earlier, there are over 800 elected officials, businesses, and other stakeholder groups in support of this legislation. But this amendment would throw that all aside in favor of a single special interest group. At our hearing on this bill, Roy Knott, a logger and business owner from Aberdeen, Washington, testified in support of the bill because of the economic benefits of conservation and the sponsor's effort to scale back earlier proposals in order to address concerns about timber jobs. This amendment ignores the history of environmental degradation in this region and rejects the bill sponsor's efforts to restore wilderness characteristics back to important forest ecosystems. This, the potential wilderness in this amendment would remove, is intended to allow forest restoration and remediation, which could include selective thinning and would require a local workforce to complete. The bill promotes bringing this area back to its natural state so that it can be protected for future generations. This should be something that we all support. Of the wilderness designations in this bill, the vast majority are already precluded from timber harvest as roadless area, riparian area, or late successional reserve. We should always strive to strike a balance between conservation and development, but we should also recognize how past development has harmed clean water, wildlife, and our environment, and take appropriate steps to remediate those damages as the potential wilderness in H.R. 2642 would allow. I urge opposition to the amendment, and I yield back. General, General Lady Yields, uh, any uh, further discussion of the amendment? Uh, I do. Mr. Bishop. I have a question for Mr. Westman, if you would. Um, General Lady just talked about how rest restoring this to its natural state is the best way of preserving this for the future. You're a trained forester. Can you just comment on the accuracy of that assumption? Well, I'm not sure how you uh, return something to its natural state unless you do management uh, practices on it. I actually have another amendment that addresses uh, those issues as well. Um, the, the natural state, if you put this in wilderness area where the Wilderness Act basically says you cannot do management on the land, is going to be to uh, um, let fires burn through it and, and hope for the best. So active management has an ability of actually improving the land, whereas just letting it go to its natural state and we see examples of that in a, a lot of different places where you can, can manage young forest and get that, uh, even if it's an even age forest through management over time, you can get a, a multi-age uh, mixed forest top and canopy that resembles a, a I mean, the, the term natural is very subjective, but uh, something that you might have seen here uh, before pre-European settlers that was being managed by Native Americans. All right, thank you. Sometimes I just, we, we have, reclaiming my time, obviously. Sometimes we, uh, we have euphemistic phrases that we throw out a lot, and I don't know what the true meaning of those are. And with that, thank you, sir. I'll yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Is there any further discussion on Mr. Westerman's amendment? Hearing no further debate, the question is on the Westerman Amendment number two to the ANS. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. 
The amendment is not agreed to. Gentlemen, request a roll call and vote postponed pursuant to the prior announcement. Representative Westerman, uh, you have the next amendment designated as number four, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is my, my last amendment. I'm not trying to break any records set by my colleague here to my right. Uh, <laughs> three, three amendments today. Uh, but this amendment goes along with the, uh, the previous discussion we just had. It, it adds a, a savings clause for forest service vegetation management activities that are consistent with the relevant forest plan and, and federal law. Uh, as we talked about, this one quarter mile buffer on the wild and scenic rivers outside of the proposed wilderness area amounts to about 60,000 acres of additional uh, land in the Olympic National Forest. More than 22,000 of those acres are young stands, and these stands are areas where future forest management could be appropriate and actually I believe is very necessary if you indeed want to restore this land to a, uh, uh, something that resembles more of an old, uh, naturally occurring forest. Um, these are also lands that are closest to communities and that are important for public access. Uh, again, I can't stress enough, this is a common sense amendment that simply allows the Forest Service to use relevant resources for vegetation and forest management practices. Uh, practices that are science-based and, and by the book. And I think uh, decades from now, if you were to be able to, to see ahead that what these forests would look like if these practices were put into place, uh, everyone would agree that the right decision was being made to let the Forest Service carry out the management plan that they have on these lands. That's why I encourage adoption of this amendment and I yield back. Gentleman yields, uh, any dis further discussion on the amendment? Ms. Holland. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in opposition to this amendment. The amendment would allow commercial logging up to the banks of rivers designated as wild or scenic in the bill. This is another special interest amendment that ignores the bill sponsor's effort to address timber industry concerns. The amendment doesn't consider how these activities would impact the outstanding qualities for which these rivers are being designated and disregards the local stakeholders who support protecting rivers as wild or scenic. Logging is generally inconsistent with the designation of a wild river. However, there are numerous examples of selective thinning near rivers designated as scenic or recreational. Past logging impacted forest health, water quality, and wildlife habitat, justifying the creation of a forest reserve, national monument, and eventually national park in this area. H.R. 2642 continues this conservation legacy by designating the first wild and scenic rivers on the Olympic Peninsula. Many of these rivers are fed by melting snowpack and glacial waters flowing from high in Olympic National Park down through steep valleys and into the surrounding Olympic National Forest. This amendment is a misguided attack on efforts to protect these free-flowing rivers for the benefit of future generations and yet again disregards the desire of hundreds of local stakeholders in support of a single special interest. I urge opposition to this amendment and I yield back. General Lady Yields, is there any further discussion of the amendment? Mr. Gomer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would give my time to my friend from Arkansas. Nobody knows more about wild and scenic designations than Arkansas. I think the gentleman uh, from Texas, and I would, I would just, for the record, like to uh, uh, take objection to one of the comments that were made about allowing harvesting down to the river's edge. Um, I would challenge anyone to show me a site in our country where we harvest trees down to a stream's edge uh, right now, or especially clear cut down to a stream's edge. I can say I have seen that before where a, a large river like the Mississippi River is changing course and it's actually taking the bank out and, and pulling trees into the river and there are exceptions that allow you to remove some of those trees, but that is not a normal forestry practice to for sure clear cut down to a stream's edge. Uh, one of the main objectives of proper forest management is to protect water quality, and you protect water quality by having 
uh, resilient forest vegetation uh, in these riparian areas. Uh, and I can't imagine, certainly not the Forest Service on federal land ever clear-cutting trees down to a stream's edge. So I, I take exception to, to that. And again, this is applying the existing forest management plan on a young forest to get that forest to a healthy condition over time. And uh, it's just good sound science and it's not clear cutting anything down to a stream's edge. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Hearing no further debate on the, que on the, que the question is now on the Westerman Amendment number four to the ANS and uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, indicate by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. The, the no's have it and the amendment is not agreed to. A uh, recorded vote has been uh, requested and the vote will be postponed pursuant to the announcement. Are there any other amendments on, on this legislation? The item for consideration now is H.R. 3977, off, offered by Representative Holland. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples of the United States be discharged from further consideration of, of the bill. And without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open to amendment at, uh, at any time. Uh, I will now uh, recognize Representative Holland to speak to the legislation. Uh, Ms. Holland, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to speak in support of the Justice for Native Survivors of Sexual Violence Act to stop the excessive rates of violent crimes that Native American women are experiencing on reservations. This bill works to restore authority to tribes so they can prosecute cases of sexual assault, sex trafficking, and stalking in Indian country. Public safety in Indian country should be one of Congress's top priorities because if the rates of sexual violence against any other group of women in the United States were as high as the rates are now for Native American women, it would be a national crisis, not a silent one. Today, availability of law enforcement on reservations is far below the national average. The ratio of officers to land on reservations is about 3,000 federal and tribal law enforcement officers who are responsible for crimes across 56 million acres, which is approximately two officers per geographic areas the size of Delaware. Making matters worse, victims are often over 100 miles away from the closest state or federal courthouse if the victim is lucky enough to get internet or phone reception to call for help during or after an attack. This general lack of public safety resources on reservations alone is institutionalized discrimination in and of itself. I cannot stress how important this bill is for tribes to finally be able to prosecute violent perpetrators who heinously stalk, sexually assault, or commit sex trafficking of Native women. I am grateful for the work that the ultraviolet organization has done to show the immediacy of this issue by putting together a list of 15,300 people who are requesting that this committee move this bill forward so Native women can finally have justice when and if they are assaulted. By not passing this bill, sexual predators that victimize Native women who live in extremely remote locations will have free reign. By not supporting this bill, We'll, there will be a continuation of physical, emotional, and sexual violence against Native women who will pass this trauma on to their next generations, as has happened thus far. By not supporting this bill, we would be denying women basic legal protections to seek justice after their bodies are unwillingly violated. No woman should ever be denied basic human rights protections, especially when the justification for denying a woman access to legal recourse after being sexually assaulted rests on two underlying factors, including one, the geographic location where she lives, and two, her race. 
I strongly urge my colleagues to do the right thing and support this bill so Native women finally have the same protections as any other group of women in the United States, and I yield back my time. Thank you. General Lady Yields, any, anyone else, any member wish to be recognized? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I have a few questions for the, the general lady from New Mexico uh, about this legislation. Uh, would you be willing to answer a few questions? I, I, first, I, I want to thank you for bringing this legislation up, and, and I want to fully concur that, that uh, your, your geographical location should not um, have any impact whatsoever on whether there's a remedy for someone subjected to domestic violence or abuse. And so certainly to the degree that there's any void in that, that needs to be fixed, and I want to commend you for working to address that void. But, but I want to make sure I understand three things. Number one, um, is there currently a void? Meaning, if, if, if domestic violence is carried out on tribal lands, is, is there a void under current law to where there is not a remedy and there is not a, a process by which someone can be prosecuted and convicted for that crime? So the issue is whether non-tribal members can be prosecuted in tribal courts. And, I mean, this is compounded, right? Because, as I mentioned earlier, there are just, you know, there's two officers for a, a, a land the size of Delaware. So quite often, uh, a lot of these folks go free. By the time you call a police officer, and they arrive two hours or whatever later, um, you know, perpetrators have fled. So the, it, this is a compounded issue. When we have an opportunity to hold someone accountable, uh, tribal courts, if they have tribal courts, should be able to do that. Uh, if people are committing crimes on their land. So I, I want to make sure I understand. So in, in this case, what's happening is that people are fleeing by the time law enforcement comes. So is it not, and, and I'm, I don't know the answer to this question, tribal police don't have the ability to arrest and detain a non-tribal member? Tribal, so first of all, there are 573 tribes in this country. I, I can't tell you the number of tribes who actually have police departments, but not every tribe has a police department. So sometimes the tribes have to rely on the Bureau of Indian Affairs Police. Yeah. Uh, if they don't have, uh, and they may not even have a place to detain uh, a perpetrator. If you don't have the proper place to, to detain someone, you can't detain them, right? So, so, so I'm not sure how this bill would address that then, because this doesn't provide police. This bill doesn't provide police. It provides the jurisdiction of the tribal courts. Um, so I, I guess where, where it's my understanding that under current federal law that it, it is illegal to commit domestic violence no matter where you are in the United States. And, and what this bill would do is it would subject the jurisdiction of non-tribal members to tribal courts. That's what this does. Whereas right now, domestic violence can be prosecuted or, or uh, folks, someone can be convicted under a federal court. Um, and, and so this moves the jurisdiction for non-tribal members from a federal court, and as, as it is today, to a tribal court. And so I want to be very clear that there is nothing under current law that provides a void. There is no void there today. Um, anyone is subject to, uh, to, to conviction, to prosecution and conviction under federal law and federal courts. By moving this to a tribal court, would a non-tribal member, would, a, would a, an American citizen um, be guaranteed their, their rights under the Bill of Rights and the Constitution in a tribal court, if subjected to a tribal court? Will the gentleman yield? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I'd like to address that, because that is a big concern of mine. Currently, under uh, Section 1304 of Title 25, it says, the participating tribe shall provide the defendant all other rights whose protection is necessary under the Constitution of the United States in order for Congress to recognize and affirm the inherent power of the participating tribe. It goes on. That's not defined. That's obscure. So I would submit, it's why I've got an amendment to bring up, 
we can't be sure that an American citizen would have the rights under the Constitution on tribal land. I yield back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield back. i got 10 seconds. Mr. Gallego, recognize. Thank you, and I uh, rise in support of, of this bill. You know, just because there are federal prosecution standards for uh, tribal uh, land, crimes committed on tribal land by non-tribal members, does not necessarily mean that's going to be a perfect execution of the law. This is why we have local jurisdictions also that enforce federal standards, too. Number two, we've had this argument that has been going on now since we stopped um, you know, the annihilation of tribes in the 1970s that we want tribal governments to be self-sustaining and sovereign. So the one area that we don't let them have some sustaining sovereign is where there are actual tribal uh, police with tribal courts, we tell them that we do not trust them uh, to enforce their laws and to seek justice for their tribal members. So I think this is actually closing a loophole. Um, and while there is a problem in terms of how, of how many tribal police there are per square mile, it's even worse when you look at how many federal uh, police agents, uh, whether it's the FBI or the BIA, uh, that are found uh, on tribal land. So we are actually empowering a community that we've been saying we want to empower you by closing a loophole. Uh, and the, the idea that we're somehow going to neglect uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, American citizens' rights because they're in tribal court is also, uh, it, it, it's just, it, it's not even remotely true. Native Americans are citizens. They are covered under the Constitution of the United States. They're going to give everyone saying the same due process rights uh, as anybody else. Uh, and, you know, for many of you that maybe do not have a lot of uh, Native American tribes, you should go visit some of these tribal courts. They are quite advanced. Uh, they're on par with uh, uh, you know, some of our most sophisticated uh, courts. Uh, yes, there's some areas that have problems, uh, but those that are ready to uh, 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 you know, adjudicate justice on behalf of those members uh, will be able to do so in a manner that we are, I believe, going to be proud of. So uh, with that, I'll yield uh, my remaining time to Representative Holland. Thank you, Mr. Gallego. I just wanted to add that um, this essentially expands the jurisdiction of tribal courts. Not all tribal courts are tr are, have implemented the Violence Against Women Act. And so therefore, not all tribal courts can, can adjudicate these issues. Uh, and additionally, the Major Crimes Act, which governs which, uh, which crimes uh, tribes can try, um, they only, it only covers certain crimes. Um, it, and not only that, if some of you saw that movie, um, Wind River, where the woman was found dead, and immediately the FBI rushed out to the reservation to investigate this crime that happened to this woman, that never happens. The FBI doesn't drop what they're doing to rush out to an Indian tribe where some woman has been killed or raped or assaulted. Half the time, they don't even know about these. The tribe. The tribal police, the tribal court, the chairman, the governor, they can all call the FBI and say, look, we've had an assault here, and they'll take their sweet time getting out there. It's not because maybe they don't care. It's maybe there's not enough FBI to cover Indian country, or they don't understand that these are issues that we care deeply about. So I, I was sitting in a hearing uh, at, on the Senate Indian Affairs Committee when the FBI essentially when we don't know what to do about this issue. Tribes need to be able to take these things into their own hands when they can, and we shouldn't be a, a barrier to stop them from doing so. A native women will be assaulted 10 times more than any other woman in this country, and they deserve to feel like somebody cares about them. And I, I, I really, I have to believe that all of you understand that and all of you care about that also. Because if you saw any woman being assaulted, you'd be the first person to step in there and stop it. And this is how we're doing this. We're giving tribes the opportunity to, have a, to be able to manage their own affairs, to be self-determined, to, to self-govern their communities. And yes, not all tribes have that. Not all tribes have police departments. Not all tribes have tribal courts. But the ones that do, they should be able to move this forward. When I was a law student at UNM School of Law, 
I held the very first jury trial in my tribal court. It was, the jury box was used for uh, a storage place. They had boxes stored in the jury box uh, because no one had ever had a, 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 a trial there before for a criminal um, trial. And so I'm just saying that we deserve this opportunity and I hope that you all will support this bill. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bishop, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just would like to say um, to Ms. Holland on behalf of our side, this is a truly significant issue. This is a significant problem. Our intent over here is not to destroy this legislation but to make sure that it works and that it solves that particular problem. We did not have a hearing on this bill on our side. The Senate did have a hearing on this issue, and you mentioned that you were there. And in that, that hearing, the Department of Justice at that time expressed the desire to take, as they said, measured approaches with this kind of bill to work with the committee to ensure the legislation will weather a judicial challenge. The worst thing we would like to do is pass legislation to be overturned by the courts, which would allow then all non-Native American uh, violators or predators to be set free just because there was a change in the procedure. And I think that's what we we're talking about over here. The United States Supreme Court has held that tribes do not possess an inherent power over non-Natives, and it's expressed their doubts on whether Congress can grant that power. However, that does not, still does not solve the problem of the, the violence against women taking place. So what we are trying to say, I think, on this side is the amendments that we will be presenting to this particular bill are not going to be in an effort to try and derail the bill or stop the discussion of the issue, but to try and clarify some problems that we hope will not fester in the future and become issues that could allow a predator simply to go free when they should not have done that. We want to make sure we cover all the bases in this in what the legal standards that would go to the court are. So I, I want it to be clear that all the amendments that we will be talking about on our side are in an effort to try and strengthen that process and that from our side we want to work with this committee as well as Ms. Holland as far as her bill as it goes forward to try and make sure that those issues are clarified so that it can be a really strong piece of legislation that solves the problem. And that's the sole effort there. I know, Mr. Graves, you were, you were running out of time. Would you like a few minutes of mine? I'll yield to you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Ranking Member. Um, I, I, I want to reiterate what I said at the very beginning. Could not be more supportive of what your objective is. Um, I want to respond to the comments from the gentleman from Arizona. Um, as the ranking member just stated, that statement was absolutely incorrect. And the Supreme Court has held that the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution do not apply to tribal courts. Um, um, I, I really wish we had had a hearing where we could have flushed some of this out. There, there are two concerns that I have. Number one, it, it, it sounds like part of the concern or the, the deficiency here in this whole uh, issue of domestic violence on, on tribal lands is, is perhaps quickly getting law enforcement there to arrest and detain the, 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 the folks who carried out these atrocious acts. And so this bill doesn't address that, and that seems like something that maybe we need to talk about to figure out how these people aren't allowed to go flee, that we make sure we have a way of detaining them as quickly as possible. Secondly, um, and I know that my friend from Texas has an amendment on this, um, the, 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 the constitutional rights, the, applica the application of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution to American citizens subjected to tribal courts, those rights need to be protected under this legislation. And, and I think that's very important in considering that it sounds like folks were under the assumption that those rights were preserved, that, that my friend from Texas's amendment should hopefully go through unanimously, that everyone here agrees that American citizens should have the protections of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. So again, I want to thank my friend from Texas uh, for, for bringing uh, these amendments up. Uh, last thing is that in your opening statement, you said something about restoring the rights of the tribal courts in this case. Um, I am not aware of a case in history where tribal courts have, have exercised this jurisdiction, and I, and I think that it would be helpful for us to know whether or not this is a restoration 
of jurisdiction or this is actually an expansion of jurisdiction. Um, I just I, I want to make sure that for the record we have a we have some clarity there. So with that, uh, yield back and thank you, Mr. Costa. Mr. Yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I, I think this is an important discussion that Thank we're you, having. Uh, I support uh, H.R. 3977, and by reference, it's on our consent calendar, but H.R. 4957 that uh, Representative Gallegos is also carrying. It's on the consent calendar. And I want to make two points here. Um, one, um, as the uh, co-chair and founder of the Victims' Rights Caucus, um, our focus on, on issues involving victims of crime across this country is one that we care deeply about. This is an important piece of legislation, I think has already been noted by the author, as well as by others, um, about the violence that takes place that is perpetrated on women and children uh, around the country. Um, and these are victims of crime. Uh, this particular piece of legislation attempts to try to uh, address the issues of crime victims on tribal lands. Uh, it's well documented. It's uh, a circumstance that I think this committee and the Congress needs to respond to. I think this legislation attempts to do that. Um, and um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that violent crimes on reservations are no different than violent crimes in our, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, or anywhere else in the country. And our attempt uh, when we have those kinds of violent crimes is to figure out ways in which we can support law enforcement to address that. That's what the author's trying to do in this sense, is to try to figure out ways in which these violent crimes that are perpetrated upon women and children are addressed in a way that we think that is appropriate for all Americans. And I don't need to remind any of us here that uh, Native Americans are citizens of our country. I think we, uh, they're the first citizens of our country, and thank you, Mr. Gagas, for pointing that out. The fact of the matter is, is this legislation, I think, is a work in progress, okay? Uh, we can talk about some of the issues that need to be addressed, and I think that's appropriate. Uh, clearly, I think the author wants to ensure, as a person who cares about the legal process, that, in fact, that we dot the I's and cross the T's. Um, but I, I will suspect that all of us who represent Native Americans and have uh, tribal lands in our constituencies understand the challenge. Um, you know, you'd probably be surprised in California, I think we have 104 recognized sovereign nations in California. Think about that, 104 sovereign nations. Uh, and they're various sizes. We don't recognize California as a sovereign. <laughs> we think we are a sovereign nation, fifth largest economy in the world, anyway. 40 million people. But the fact is, is that uh, uh, not one size fits all. As the author noted, some have tribal courts, some don't. Some have uh, police uh, functioning uh, operations on their tribes, some don't. Uh, so one size doesn't fit all in terms of how you address this. And geographical issues on tribe, tribal lands in the Southwest are particularly difficult to manage because you have a lot of land uh, and a rather comparatively sparse population. It's not like you have a town of 10,000 and you got the court and you got everybody, the police department, everything else that can respond. So this attempts to deal with a real need, a real need. And um, so as a, a co-chair of the bipartisan Victims' Rights Caucus, this is a legislation that I intend that the caucus should support, like the Violence Against Women's Act. And so there are many predators that are out there slipping through the cracks. They should be punished when that happens. They should be dealt with. And I think the bipartisanship in this own efforts uh, with not only the, the member carrying the legislation, but uh, Congress members Cook and Gallegos and Cole and, and Cherise Davis reflects, I think, uh, leadership on this legislation. So I would urge you to support it. Clearly, we need to address some of the issues that have been raised and that's appropriate, and so I see this legislation as good, a work in progress, and uh, I want to add my support to it and to 4957 as well. I yield back the balance of my time. Back to you. Thank you. Yes, I'll be, I'll be happy to yield to Congressman oh. Gallegos. The time was up. No, he had 40 seconds. Mr. Chairman. 
Well, Mr. McClintock was next, and then I go back. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm a strong supporter of tribal sovereignty, and that includes the sovereignty of tribal courts under their own uh, uh, their members. Um, but extending the tribal jurisdiction to non-tribal members, I'm concerned, crosses a very bright line, and I want to be sure I understand the implications of, of, of this legislation. Uh, Ms. Holland, I'm a customer that's go that goes to a casino, um, and I am charged with inappropriately touching a, uh, a, a waitress there at the casino. Um, the normal enforcement would be uh, uh, I would uh, be, be tried in a federal court under all due process rights and the Bill of Rights, including the right to a jury of my peers. But under this legislation, if I were simply, if the, if the accusation were made, I wouldn't be tried in a federal court, I'd be tried in a tribal court? You're yielding to Yes. Me. Okay. Uh, so first of all, if, it's, if, you, if it was inappropriate touching at a casino, uh, that doesn't fall under the Major Crimes Act, so that wouldn't go to the FBI. Well, well whatever. If, right. if, if I'm yeah. accused of such a crime, I would not have recourse to the federal courts. I would have recourse. I, I would well, be tried Well, I mean, that's court. it's a little complicated because uh, sometimes if you're a casino, it depends on the geographic area. They might have an MOU with the you know with the local police well, I understand. or whatever I understand, it what is. What you're doing right? is you're extending tribal jurisdiction over non-tribal members, including folks who go to a casino and, and may be frivolously accused of a, of a serious crime. Um, our due process rights protect us in the federal courts, but as I read this bill, that protection is no longer there. I would be tried in a tribal court. And as Mr. Costa said, we have hundreds of tribes in California, mm -hmm. uh, at least over 100 tribes. I realize there are some big tribal jurisdictions, but in California, many of these uh, tribes uh, number a few hundred to maybe a thousand or two members, um, um, many of them uh, related. Um, so, I assume so in the jury pool would be drawn from this tight-knit community in a tribal court without the protection of due process rights, or at least not the guarantee of due process rights. So. As, again, as I mentioned earlier, some tribes have um, implemented uh, the Violence Against Women Act with respect to how tribal courts can um, have the jurisdiction over non-tribal members. And additionally, uh, California is a PL-280 state, right? So state courts can have jurisdiction on some tribal land. So my guess is if it were happening in California, that you might or well, whoever know, might end up being tried in state court. What I'm hearing from you is maybe, maybe not depends upon the jurisdiction, but it's the maybe not that really concerns me because I think we are crossing a very bright line here. And I'll tell you something else. If I were a, uh, uh, an Indian tribe, uh, uh, a gaming tribe running a casino, uh, I would be scared to death of, of uh, a bill like this because it's telling all of your customers, yeah, a mere accusation will land you in a tribal court uh, without your recourse to the federal courts. I don't know if it's I, I, I would think that would be absolutely chilling to business. You know, if, uh, I, I wouldn't take such a risk. I don't think anyone in his right mind would take such a risk. If they're losing their American constitutional due process rights the moment they step on a tribal uh, uh, reservation. Well, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's when you bring in the casino part of it, you know, there, the casi there's casinos. Well, any visitor. Are so, maybe it's not a so casino. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, a, a shopping complex. Maybe it's a gas station. Uh, uh, any, any number of, of commercial ventures that the, the tribes run that invite non-tribal members uh, uh, to, to, to participate, I think if, if, if you knew that you, by crossing that line, you were losing your due process rights and a mere accusation of a crime could land you in a tribal court with a very tight-knit jury on the other side, I'd be scared to death of that. Well, if people thought, if, if, if people who wanted to go on tribal lands and rape women and kill women and kidnap women and Well, that's and, why we have laws against kids, that. And that's and, why we have laws against maybe reclaiming, they would reclaiming be. my time. Yes. That's why we have federal laws against those heinous acts. But those federal laws also provide due process rights to the accused so that, so that uh, 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 mere accusations that are false accusations uh, can be protected against uh, in our court system. 
you're removing that protection. And that's what concerns me greatly. And again, if I were a gaming tribe, I would be most concerned about that uh, because I think it would have a chilling effect on any commerce uh, that they're inviting onto their land. Gentleman yields. Mr. Van Drew, you raised your hand. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, um, Mr. Bishop, I wanted just to clarify something. Uh, the hearing on the Senate side uh, was, was before I was sworn in, and it was actually a hearing on missing and murdered Indigenous women specifically, not on this issue. I just wanted to clarify that because, and I also wanted to say that since I have been sworn in, uh, we had a hearing on missing and murdered Indigenous women right in this room. We've had a roundtable on it. We've had a number of, of um, um, uh, hearings or conversations or roundtables or whatever uh, you'd like to call them regarding that specific issue. And uh, would just like to say that any and all of you are certainly invited to attend any of those. So um, you can learn more about that specific issue, and I yield my time. Gentleman yields back. Yeah, thank you. Sublime. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I can see some of the arguments where some tribes have a small number of members. Uh, I come from a district where a population is small, Truthfully, everybody knows everybody else. And we have had jury cases, I mean cases where jurors were convened. And in the beginning it looked like, you know, there may be questions about the independence of the jurors, if they're qualified, I mean, if they're able to make, you know, judgments. We need to accept that we need to trust the jurors that they're capable of making judgments based on the, the law and on the facts. We, we cannot continue to hold back and say there's certain tribes are not qualified to do the jobs of jurors. Um, and I think the law is saying that where there is a tribe, an Indian tribe, a country where there are no laws on domestic violence, then of course the federal laws apply. Although the courts of that tribe, that Indian country, will convene and, and make the charges. And uh, it's gonna to be tough, I understand that. I, I'm, I'm even at home, I mean, sometimes we question the jurors, but after time, we're beginning to, you know, it takes time, but, uh, and not being tried by a juror of your peers, these are citizens of the United States as well, and I guess that's a jury of my peers. Fundamental is that they're, um, we're both American citizens, and that uh, those are our peers. I, I, may, I may be wrong, Mr. McClintock, uh, but gentleman from California, but um, yeah, I, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from, sir. And um, I, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman yields. Mr. Hoffman, sir, recognized. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm just a little confused by Mr. Graves' statement that the Supreme Court has said the Bill of Rights do not apply uh, in Indian country because uh, I look at, at uh, 25 U.S. Code Section 1302 and it very clearly incorporates all of the Bill of Rights and applies them in Indian country and makes it quite clear that no tribe exercising its self-governance authority may deprive anyone uh, of their constitutionally protected rights. So I wonder if, if you could tell me the specific Supreme Court case that you believe stands for this proposition. I'm happy to take a look at it, but I think we're I think we're uh, overly mystifying this subject, and I think there's this very specific U.S. Code section that I just cited that's on point. Um, uh, gentleman's yielding? I, I, I do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I believe the ranking member actually cited this specific case. Which case? In, in his statement earlier, um, the Supreme Court case, 
and be happy to provide that to you right now. The, the other thing, uh, the gentleman from California, very important, in your state of California, your state has concurrent jurisdiction in the tribes. So you could potentially, under the legislation, just something else we need to be thoughtful of moving forward. You could be tried by the tribal court, by the federal government, and by the state on the same thing. Right, well, the double, 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 so it's something we need to be thoughtful of as we move forward. Reclaiming my time, on. double jeopardy is one of those uh, constitutional rights that, that is uh, applied by the code section I just cited. So, no, you're wrong. Um, but I want to know the Supreme Court case that, that you believe stands for this sweeping proposition that, that seems to defy yep. common sense. Would the gentleman yield, Mr. Hoffman? Yeah. Um, I think what we're trying, at least what I'm trying to do, is seek some clarity here and intent and, and what is not intended. Um, I have some real-life examples. I talked about some of the... Uh, tribal uh, uh, native sovereign nations in my area there that have very successful tribal gaming facilities uh, within a radius of a major metropolitan area, and that's not unusual in California. In, in I think all three cases, none of them have a police force and none of them have a court system. Uh, and 99% of their business in the event of these gaming and hotel facilities are by non-native uh, Americans who live by and like to go and enjoy these facilities. If they perpetrate a crime in that casino, in that hotel, in a bathroom or in a hotel room, uh, that is a violent crime that is under federal law, uh, Mr. Huffman, and they would be, and, and, and what the tribe has is a memorandum of understanding with the local sheriff's office and right, and and so they would be treated like any other uh, person who perpetrated a crime on a victim, on a woman, uh, regardless of what the setting. Just because it was on tribal land, would not uh, subject or limit their ability to uh, be tried and have uh, their rights would be protected, but they would still be tried as a perpetrator of a crime. Right. Uh, that's exactly right, and, and just reclaiming my time, unless the gentleman had more, um, if some of these wild scenarios that have been thrown out uh, were to apply and, and a tribe for some reason uh, deprive someone of their constitutional rights, they would be able to seek a writ of habeas corpus in a federal court uh, to protect those rights. The, the U.S. Code section I cited is very unambiguous on this subject, so I'm, I'm, I continue to wait for this Supreme Court case that apparently um, someone believes, uh, says differently. Mr. Westerman, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield time to Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClintock. Well, I, I don't, uh, uh, in response to my friend from California, uh, I don't have a court citation. I simply have our analysis, and it could be wrong, but it says that uh, uh, all, uh, all persons in any country of a tribe are subject to tribal law, not federal law. Uh, under federal court precedent, the U.S. Constitution does not apply to tribes. That may Sorry, or may what not, case that, that may or may not, may not be correct, but let me get to the crux of my concern. Any tribal member is also a uh, citizen of the uh, state of the nation. Not all citizens of the state and the nation are also tribal members. When you are restricting a jury pool like that, you are ipso facto denying uh, the, the right of a jury of peers. Um, and, and particularly when you're dealing with small jurisdictions, uh, that becomes a very, very serious concern over the impartiality of, of, a, um, of a jury. Now, that may or may not be the case, um, but I wouldn't want to risk it, and I, and, and I think that this kind of law would absolutely kill commercial activities on tribal lands that depend upon people uh, 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 coming uh, onto the tribal land to conduct commerce. Because, yes, I know you'll balance my time, Mr. Yeah. Oh, and, no, I guess be and I apologize for being slow with citations because uh, our understanding was that this was so settled it would not likely be a source of controversy. But uh, the idea that tribes were not subject to limitation by the Bill of Rights because of their established sovereignty was most clearly communicated in Talton versus Mays, 163 U.S. 376, 1896. In Talton, the Supreme Court held that the native nations are distinct 
independent political communities, and those are in quotes, and found that tribal governments and their courts were not subject to Fifth Amendment limitations applicable to federal and state governments because of their distinctiveness that predates the Constitution. And I have here, uh, this is from the American Indian Law Desk book that uh, lawyers and others that uh, work on uh, with legal issues on reservations they rely heavily on. This was prepared by a conference of Western Attorneys Generals uh, who have researched, add to, and um, make changes as necessary. But this is what they say. Um, talking about the tribal reservations, they're not foreign nations separate and apart from the United States. Instead, they are domestic dependent nations located within the United States territory that have certain retained inherent powers of self-government. Consistent with this quasi-sovereign status, Indian tribes are not parties to the United States Constitution and derive no power or obligations directly from it, despite being mentioned twice. And the citations for that, uh, Idaho versus Coeur d'Alene Tribe, 521 U.S. 261 uh, in 1997, and Blatchford versus Native Village of Notak, and that's 501 U.S. 775 in 1991. So it goes on to say, tribes are thus not subject to the limitations on governmental action contained in the Bill of Rights of the 14th Amendment. And that's why I've got an amendment to bring here shortly. It's because the uh, ICRA, uh, it is in effect the Bill of Rights for reservations. And the concern is a very legitimate concern that if somebody commits some heinous crime that Ms. Holland is trying to get addressed here and it's someone who is not a native, not an Indian, not a Native American. That scoundrel is going to have a good shot at knocking that down because he wasn't afforded his Fifth Amendment rights under the Constitution because uh, of the bill that we put in place that would end up, I think, getting knocked down. So the law seems to be pretty settled for for. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well more than a century, and that's why my friends on our side are so concerned about getting it addressed so that we can address Ms. Holland's con legitimate concern. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, recognize it myself. I think, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Ms. Holland for uh, her remarks and her leadership on this issue, the two oversight hearings that uh, were held on the topic of uh, murdered and, mi and missing indigenous women were uh, significant and uh, informative. I think that, that we, and the indisputable fact, indisputable fact that uh, Na American Indian and Alaska Native women experienced murder rates 10 times the national average, and many offenders continue to go unpunished. And this bill's intent is to change that. And, it, and, the effort, and the way to do that is uh, recalling that in 2013, uh, we noted the tribe's ability in that legislation on the Violence Against Women Act of 2013, the tribe's ability to prosecute non-native perpetrators. The Holland Bill simply expands that definition and extends the uh, 1968 uh, Civil Rights Act, Native for uh, Indian Civil Rights Act, to extend that jurisdiction and your right of tribal courts to cover the crimes of sexual violence. I, I think the intent is to uh, to deal with this issue. That uh, you know, even the Attorney General uh, met with tribal leaders in the Midwest and uh, indicated that there would be some resource support, ten regional people to study and make recommendations about what should be done. That is a resource side of the question. Uh, this is the, the jurisdictional issue, and how do you empower, and empowering tribal courts 
uh, to be able to prosecute perpetrators, and more importantly, I think as importantly, serve as a significant deterrent to the 10 times the rate of assault and murder that we see in Indian country with uh, murder, murder indigenous women. That's the intent of the legislation. I appreciate the concerns that have been brought up, but uh, I think this, as this legislation moves forward, those concerns need to be addressed. And I think they can be addressed, and I think the, the, the jur that we as a Congress uh, do have that ability, and, and we as a Congress do have the parameters by which uh, courts that are prepared to in, in Indian country to deal with it, deal with it. Uh, those that are not obviously can't. And, uh, I, but that's discussions going forward. We have an amendment from Mr. Gomer that's coming up that I, uh, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to move on to because uh, we're going to continue this discussion with, with that amendment. That's fine. We have to circulate the amendment that it was filed. Uh, Mr. Gomer, you have the First Amendment, number one, and you're recognized, sir. And, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to thank Ms. Holland. You know, sometimes we get caught up in rather rigorous debate around here, and I detected nice nothing but sincerity from the gentlelady, and I really appreciated your comments when you said that you felt like people on our side would step up immediately and do what they could to stop that kind of uh, heinous abuse of women. And, and I look around this chamber, and I can honestly say that about everybody on both sides of the aisle. So I just want to thank you, because often we get caught up in our debates, and, and I appreciate that. I think you're right. I think all of us would. And I'm torn a bit. I've already addressed a number of things about my amendment, but I... I have a very similar feeling to the one I had when we were taking up uh, renewal of the Voting Rights Act in judiciary. And I urged publicly and privately our uh, Jim Sensenbrenner and John Conyers, look, this has an unconstitutional provision. The Supreme Court is going to strike this. Let's fix it now because you're going to leave this thing. We can work together. We can get this, but this is not constitutional. And actually, Mr. Conyers was more open <laughs> than our, our ranking member at the time, but, um, but they didn't fix it. And it went up and it was struck down and it still uh, remains unfixed. So. I just think it only makes sense to fix this constitutional issue that I just really, you know, there's so many things you go, well, that could go either way. I really feel strongly this would, would cause the problem to have this struck. So uh, I would like to fix it now. I don't want this kind of violence to go unaddressed. And the gentlelady made some wonderful points. Uh, I mean, I've seen that in rural areas where people, not, not, not reservation, but rural areas where people don't get the help they need um, quickly enough and people just feel so hopeless and helpless. And I would like to see that addressed and especially where they don't get the attention they need. But that's the reason for this amendment um, my amendment here ensures that the rights afforded to all Americans under the Bill of Rights 14th Amendment will be equitably applied in the tribal courts. And I cited some of the basis for um, feeling this is so critically important to keep this from being struck down later. Uh, there's no question that everyone here wants to help Native American women who are victims of violence. We want to see justice done. We want to see the abusers held accountable. Um, in my times as a, uh, days as a felony judge, I had to make sure that everybody's rights were observed. People got a fair trial. They had due process, but heaven help them once they were convicted with a fair trial and due process, because this is so very heinous. But uh, we shouldn't be suspending the Constitution for 
non-Native Americans, but American citizens, and this is just a hole in the legislation that we can fix right now by passing my amendment, and for that reason, I would hope that we could have people on both sides of the aisle vote for this so that it would uh, keep the gentlelady's law uh, from being struck down on appeal and some a Native American woman who was abused, violated heinously from feeling she had no hope and that this committee let her down by failing to fix a constitutional loophole when we had the chance and we didn't. So I hope partisanship can continue to be set aside so that we can fix this problem. And I would ask everyone to support my amendment. I yield back. Thank you. Any further discussion on the amendment? Ms. Howard. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Gomert. I uh, would like to speak um, respectfully in opposition to this amendment. Um, first of all, Indian law is immensely complicated and difficult to interpret, especially as it relates to the divergence of general civil and criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. There are a couple of legal issues that stem from this proposed amendment which can be confusing when interpreting without a firm understanding of the applicability of constitutional provisions and federal criminal jurisdiction in Indian country. Uh, this case was already quoted. The U.S. Supreme Court case, Talton v. Mays, states that Native nations are distinct, independent political communities that predate the U.S. Constitution. In 1968, when civil rights issues arose, Congress passed the Indian Civil Rights Act which is now codified in federal law. The Bill of Rights are mirrored in the Indian Civil Rights Act, which is the equivalent of the Establishment Clause in the Constitution. This language of the Bill of Rights and constitutional provisions are mirrored in the Indian Civil Rights Act because it obviously wouldn't make sense for a sovereign government to adopt founding documents of a different sovereign nation. Since its introduction in 1968, the Indian Civil Rights Act has been amended to include new provisions governing tribal courts, criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who choose to commit crimes within reservation boundaries. The amendments to the Indian Civil Rights Act go further than the overarching principles found in the Bill of Rights and 14th Amendment. ICRA amendments, the Indian Civil Rights Act, like the Violence Against Women Act, explicitly spell out legal elements that must be satisfied in order for tribal courts to have special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit crimes against Native American women. Additionally, over the past 30 plus years, there have been numerous amendments to the Indian Civil Rights Act that each provide specific enumerated protections for non-Indians who were tried in tribal courts. These amendments include additional due process protections for non-Indians tried in tribal courts and can be, can be easily found in the Tribal Law and Order Act and Violence Against Women Act. Lastly, out of all the legislative mechanisms, Congress explicitly decided to enact 25 U.S.C. Section 1303, the habeas corpus for a person to challenge the legality of detention by a tribe. Congress itself decided habeas corpus would effectively strike the balance between the protection of tribal sovereignty and vindication of an individual's civil rights. A habeas corpus petition is the direct vehicle for federal review that has already been carefully considered by Congress and further supported by the U.S. Supreme Court case under Santa Clara Pueblo versus Martinez. Therefore, the adoption of this amendment would be ineffective considering the well-established legislative and legal precedent. And I yield back, Chairman. General Yelly. Gomer's amendment. Hearing no further debate, the question is on Gomer amendment number one. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. <coughs> and the opinion of the chair of the noes have it. Gentlemen asked for a roll call vote, and that uh, vote will be postponed pursuant to the prior announcement. Uh, Mr. Bishop, you recognize for the amendment? It has to be passed out. Circulate Mr. Bishop's amendment, please. Do you want me to start while they're passing it out? Please. No one's going to read it anyway. You recognize Mr. Bishop? Okay. In the minority, sometimes we. Uh, 
we do do gotcha amendments to try and make life difficult. I want Ms. Holden to realize this is not the intent of this one. My intent is not to try and derail the bill in any particular way, but to try and work to make its, its pathway more successful, especially when it, if it goes to the Senate. So this amendment is actually taken directly from Section 805 of the Senate version of their uh, Senate Violence Against Women Act, the reauthorization that has been introduced with uh, one minor detail change to it. The amendment simply creates what the Senate is asking for, which is a reporting requirement that would go to the Secretary of Interior as to how this bill is being implemented within um, Native American judicial systems. So the annual report would list the tribes that are exercising their criminal jurisdiction provisions under the VAWA Act amended by this particular act. And they would, um, and when they were beginning their exercising of those powers and how they're being administered. And so the entire amendment you could actually read if you want to. The report would recommend also ways of improving the terminal jurisdiction as well as help us identify specific ways to make this law work more effectively in Indian country. And as I said, the basic purpose is to conform it to what the Senate version would be doing so it would make it easier at some time to pass. The only difference would be uh, in the Senate version, the report comes from the Attorney General. Our version for germaneness issues has the report coming from the Secretary of Interior in cooperation and coordination with the Attorney General's office to be report being sent to our committee as well as the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. That's the purpose of which I'm trying to do this, um, to bring them into, into harmony with what the Senate's already trying to do. I'll yield back, sir. Chairman Yields, uh, any further discussion in the amendment? Ms. Holland, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in opposition to this amendment. Special tribal criminal jurisdiction and report information is already available. And in fact, the National Congress of American Indians has already published a comprehensive five-year report with all of this information, and they will continue to do so. Further, the Attorney General's office shouldn't have discretion to audit tribal courts. It's clear there is already a lack of resources at the AG's office to prosecute crimes in Indian country. No purpose uh, to dedicate scarce resources on audits that already exist. If anyone would like to see the National Congress of American Indians report, I'm sure they'd be happy to send it to your office. Uh, I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment, and I yield back. General Ye Lady yields back. Uh, any further discussion? Here we go for the debate on the amendment. The, qu the question is on the Bishop Amendment number three. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 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 Uh, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Are there any further amendments to the legislation? The item for consideration is uh, under consideration now is S209, sponsored by Senator Hoven. I ask unanimous consent the Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples of the United States be discharged from further consideration of the bill, and without objection, the bill, the bill will be considered as read and open to amendment uh, at any point. Uh, I will now recognize uh, Representative Holland to speak to the legislation. Representative, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in support of the Progress for Indian Tribes Act that was originally introduced by Senator Hoven to enhance tribal self-governance over programs funded through the Department of the Interior. The Indian Self-Determination and Education Act is one of the most important legislative acts affecting Indian country in the last 40 plus years. As a, key driving to, as a key driver to improving tribal communities. Promoting tribal yeah. self-governance and sovereignty has always been a bipartisan effort. Title IV of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act provides the legal framework under which tribes can assume control of the department's programs and associated funding and tailor those programs to the needs of their tribal communities. Enacted in 1975, the Indian Self-Determination Act was a Nixon-era initiative 
signed into law by President Gerald Ford, yet strongly supported by Democrats. Over the years, the act has been amended several times by Democratic and Republican-controlled Congresses. The bipartisan support continues today as the Progress Act was introduced to Senator Hoven and me in the House. The administration is also on record as supporting the bill. If any 11th hour amendment is enacted to Senate Bill 209, the bill will need to go back to the Senate, effectively killing the legislation for this session. Tribes have been working on getting this legislation enacted for over a decade. This bill passed through the Republican-controlled Senate with a Republican author on a voice vote simply because self-governance absolutely works for tribes. If bipartisan consensus was so easily found in the Senate, this Congress, then it should be clear that this is a common sense bill that both sides of the aisle can move forward in the House as well. And I urge my colleagues to support this bill and I yield back my time. Thank you. And the general lady yields. Uh, anyone uh, wish to be recognized in the legislation? If there's no further, uh, we're not, I'm not, there's no further uh, discussion on the legislation. Uh, I, I recognize Mr. Uh, Representative McClintock. You have the First Amendment designated as number one, sir. Great, thank Members you, Mr. Yours. Chairman. Uh, this bill takes a good program, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, and adds ambiguities that I'm afraid will ignite a firestorm of expensive, time-consuming, and wasteful litigation in the years ahead. My particular concern involves provisions relating to the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, that they would create wide-ranging implications to, to water projects throughout the Western United States. My amendment simply excludes the Bureau of Reclamation uh, from these provisions. As it's currently written, uh, the bill would allow more tribes to take over management and control of reclamation, quote, works not deemed to be performing an inherent federal function. Yet the term inherent federal function is so vaguely defined uh, that it will greatly expand the number of facilities currently serving the general public uh, that could be transferred to tribal control. Uh, this concern is heightened by provisions that require, quote, any ambiguity in a contract or funding agreement shall be resolved in favor of the Indian tribe. I'm concerned that this uh, may broaden what facilities or programs are eligible to be transferred and provides the legal protection for tribes to take over projects and programs that should be an inherent federal function. Uh, this is especially alarming considering the controversial history of this bill and the Hoopa tribe's attempts on the Trinity River. Uh, Republicans on this committee have raised concerns every time this bill has come up that the legislation could have negative impacts on federal water and land management uh, and to the general public's access to water resources, uh, but to no avail. Uh, as such, I believe the Bureau of Reclamation and the critical water infrastructure that it manages uh, should be excluded, and I'd ask for your support of this amendment. And I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields. Uh, anyone wish to be recognized in the amendment? Ms. Holland. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to speak in opposition to the amendment. This legislation has been worked on and passed out of both the House and Senate over the past decade. This amendment is a red herring. Since the self-governance was first enacted in 1994, there have been no assumptions by tribes of Bureau of Recl Reclamation projects. The problem that Amendment 1 seeks to fix is not a problem. The concern behind Amendment 1 is specious and is not founded in fact. Under the law since 1994, the conditions, requirements, and limitations mitigating against any such tribal assumption proposal of a Bureau of Reclamation project have resulted in no such assumptions. Senate, 209, Senate Bill 209 does not change the 1994 authority in this regard. In fact, S-209 in Section 101 contains a lengthy disclaimer specifically stating that it does not affect in any way the ability of tribes to take over programs or projects of interior agencies other than the BIA. If a tribe does propose to assume a BOR project under the constrained authority continued by S-209, the Interior Department has continuing full discretion to decline to approve it. This bipartisan bill is critical to the furtherance of self-governance and improvements in tribal communities. I strongly urge my colleagues 
to do the right thing and support this bipartisan legislation so that tribes can finally move forward in effectively managing programs for their people. And I yield back my time. General Lady Yields, anyone else wish to be recognized? Yeah. Mr. Bishop. Thank you again. This piece of legislation is another of those that becomes um, problematic. It has been mentioned that this has been discussed for a long, long time, and usually groups in the Senate are the ones that have screwed it up. This time, the Senate, um, using perfect Senate procedures, hotlined it so no one actually even talked about it over there. Unfortunately, there are still some languages that is in it which has been some of the problems that have stopped it in years past. And Mr. McClintock emphasized one of those in which even though Western states, which have the greatest issue in this, especially with water and state wildlife jurisdiction, have expressed their concern with the language that provides some amb ambiguity within the management authority on certain federal lands. And at the same time, there are provisions in the act which Tens, which puts in ambiguity as to where the priorities are. And that's exactly what Mr. McClintock is trying to talk about in his amendment to the bill. So this is one of those things that I don't want to have to send it back to the Senate, but the Senate screwed up. They really didn't, they didn't debate it, they didn't discuss it, they didn't have hearings, they just hotlined it and sent it to us. But the problem areas are still within the jurisdiction. What we would like to do on our side is simply still work with a good senator and work as this bill goes forward so that we can try and work something out that would be easily solving these issues, but at the same time then could be taken back by the Senate without having to go through a whole bunch of the falderall, uh, asking them just basically to do the thing they should have done in the first place. Which means, Mr. Um, Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put into the record a, a letter from my state which, ex which explains the concerns that they have over these provisions that are still ambiguous, ambiguous, as well as from the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies that also have the same, same issue. But the issues are actually basically those that are done in the western states that have most of the federal land and also the recreation and, and water issues that go along with it. Once again, these things, and thank you, if I could have that without you know, I'm consent to add that. So ordered. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. That's what you were saying. I, was, I thought you were just mumbling at me on, under. I was. Okay, I was doing fine. both. Uh -huh. No, it, it is the simple problem that that's why I support his amendment as well, is that this is an issue that still needs to be clarified. It needed to be clarified in earlier editions, as you'll see from the date on the letter, and it still has yet to be done. I wish the Senate had done their job properly instead of simply hotlining this bill and making it go through. But at some point in here, we need to clarify these particular issues. And the Western states and the, and the Fish and Wildlife Associations of the West are truly concerned about some of the ambiguities in this particular language. I don't want to kill this because I would like to solve the issue and get it done. But at the same time, you want to do it in the right way, not necessarily and, and that is not necessarily in this particular language. So with that, I speak in support of this and in the problem I have with the bill altogether, I want to get this thing done. We've been waiting a long time to do it, but there's still some problems with it. It's really not ready for prime time yet. Yield back, sir. Gentleman yields. Uh, any further uh, discussion on the amendment? Mr. McClintox. Uh, Hearing no further debate, the question is on McClintock Amendment Number 1. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, indicate by saying no. Yes. No. In the opinion of the chair, the no's have it. Sir? Gentlemen, ask for a recorded vote, and uh, the vote will be postponed pursuant to prior instructions. Uh, The item for consideration is H.R. 3742, <laughs> offered by Representative Dingle. I ask unanimous consent, Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife be discharged for further consideration of the legislation. And without objection, the bill will be considered as read and open to amendment at any point. 
Let me recognize uh, Representative Dingle to speak on the legislation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Bishop for including the Recovering America's Wildlife Act today in today's full committee markup. We are in the midst of an unprecedented biodiversity crisis. Without a change in the way we finance fish and wildlife conservation, the list of federally threatened and endangered species will grow from nearly 1,600 species today to thousands more in the future. Earlier this fall, we discovered that the number of birds in the United States and Canada have fallen by 29% since 1970, a decline of almost 3 billion fewer total birds. These developments threaten our common environmental heritage, reduce opportunities for outdoor recreation, and will require costly and aggressive emergency room measures under the Endangered Species Act, if not addressed soon. The cost of inaction is immense. The longer we wait to address this issue, the more resources we will ultimately need to safeguard our nation's wildlife and environment. This is why the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is necessary. The legislation provides $1.4 billion in dedicated annual funding to the states, territories, and Native American tribes for proactive conservation efforts for the 12,000 species of wildlife and plants identified under federally approved state wildlife action plans. This bold investment in our nation's wildlife will play significant dividends. It will allow states to take proactive action that will prevent at-risk species from becoming endangered. The resources provided in this legislation are based on the report and recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Panel on Sustaining America's Diverse Fish and Wildlife Resources, a nonpartisan panel representing the outdoor recreation retail and manufacturing sector, the energy industry, conservation organizations, and sportsmen's groups. Additionally, the Chairman's Manager Amendment makes important improvements to this legislation while maintaining the legislation's focus on wildlife recovery. These include stronger allocations for the most at-risk species, an improved wildlife funding formula to provide the states with higher levels of needed appropriation funding, and more robust accountability measures to ensure that the funds under this legislation are spent appropriately. I know that's important to the ranking member. The broad group of stakeholders supporting the Recovering America's Wildlife Act underscores the need for action and the support for this approach. Leading conservation organizations, sportsmen's groups, and businesses all support this legislation for good reason. It utilizes proven funding mechanisms, boldly addresses pressing conservation needs, and prevents the need for more costly interventions in the future. We've received letters of support from a bipartisan group of six Great Lake Governors, the Western Governors Association, as well as groups like the Congressional Sportsman Foundation and, uh, and tribal organizations. I would like to ask unanimous consent to enter those into the record. Mr. Chair, can I put these letters? Thank you. No. Thanks. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act is the product of months of work and consultation with many people, with the stakeholders, and it has very broad bipartisan support. And I've loved working with my colleagues on the other side, listening, talking to people. We have a conservation, economic, and moral rational to act in order to protect and recover America's wildlife for future generations. This is an opportunity to take historic action to address a pressing conservation need, and I strongly urge my colleagues to support this legislation. Thank you, and I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Any, uh, General Lady uh, Yields, Mr. Weston, recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I find myself a little bit conflicted over this legislation. I completely support the underlying premises of this bill. Our wildlife is a national treasure, and its management is a direct indicator of our success at being good stewards and conservationists. And while I plan on supporting this bill in committee, I 
support it with the condition that Congress has to take a new approach to the litany of conservation bills that we have considered in this Congress. This bill, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, along with its compatriots like the NAWCA, the LWCF, and Mr. Bishop's Restore Parks and Public Lands, all have laudable goals and attempt to conserve some of the best parts of this nation. However, the foundation upon which these bills are constructed is unsound. All these conservation bills, while well-intentioned, cost an astronomical amount of money and do not address the underlying systemic problems that have led us to consider these huge spending bills. Our conservation system <laughs> has a leaky roof. Yet instead of doing the hard work to replace the roof, Congress seems content to consider increasingly costly patches. Let's utilize this bill in front of us today as an example. Recovering America's Wildlife Act amounts to $1.5 billion in new mandatory spending every single year. That money would go towards state grant programs, Endangered Species Act implementation, and more, all generally good stuff. My problem, however, is that we're paying hand over fist for temporary remedies instead of working to find the actual cure. Last year's total budget amount for Fish and Wildlife's Ecological Services line, the programs that carry out what this bill seeks to achieve, was $240 million. You want to know why we have to consider a $1.5 billion spending bill? Through programs like LWCF, we're currently adding thousands of acres every year, stretching that $240 million amount over a constantly growing area. At the same time, the programs we've built to supplement appropriations and prevent these direct spending bills, like the Pittman-Robinson Fund, are shrinking yearly. Less and less people are hunting, and thus we receive smaller excise tax receipts to support, spe to support species conservation. Uh, meaningful timber receipts haven't been a part of the equation for over 40 years, and the receipts that do matter, oil and gas production, primarily are having their accounts rated more and more uh, by different programs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support the goal of this legislation and will support it. However, I urge my colleagues to start thinking outside the box. We need a new solution, a new approach to funding our public lands and conservation problems. And I hope that if this bill does move forward, uh, that it will move forward with a different approach to the funding mechanism that's currently uh, in this bill. I honestly don't think the bill in its current form has a chance of being uh, passed by the Senate and signed into law, uh, yet it attempts to address an issue that is very important and needs to be addressed. So I would welcome an opportunity to work with my colleagues across the aisle uh, to come up with a better solution uh, that accomplishes the same purpose that uh, this bill uh, aims to accomplish. The gentleman, yield. I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I I'll just go uh, a similar uh, direction, a similar direction. Uh, there there's a lot in here. You know, if we're going to talk about uh, issues in the Endangered Species Act, then that's where we need to fix it. And I I'm just very hesitant to go down a path of spending billions of dollars really without, from our, the way I understand, without any congressional oversight, uh, that is not the solution. The, the uh, attempts, the purpose, the intent is one thing, but the process that we're going down here raises grave concerns with me. The price tag is just too much, and I, because of that, I would oppose this legislation and would urge others to do the same. I yield back. I yield back. Mr. Huffman, recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd certainly want to congratulate and thank Representative Dingell. She has worked tirelessly to bring a, such a diverse set of stakeholders to the table. Uh, she has navigated competing priorities and interests throughout this process. And we've had a robust debate about this bill. Uh, I believe it's a debate that's made the bill better. As I said at the hearing in September, uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act is a very important piece of legislation that has the potential to transform the state of wildlife conservation in our country. As we think about the investments that we know we should be making to safeguard our environment for the future, 
we have to make sure that wildlife is not left behind. So in our subcommittee, uh, we've been hearing testimony all year about the many significant threats that are facing wildlife species. We've heard about habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, pollution, climate change, and more. We know that wildlife is facing uh, a potential sixth mass extinction. 29 species of birds in North America are gone. 40% of America's freshwater fish are now rare or imperiled. And so we have a bill before us that can be part of the response to this crisis. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, Congresswoman D Dingell has assembled 157 co-sponsors with strong bipartisan support. Um, according to a survey of state fish and wildlife agencies, the various states would need an additional $1.3 billion a year to fully implement their wildlife conservation plans. And this legislation would amend the Pittman-Robertson Act to help them to do that. It would direct funding from, uh, from that uh, act to, uh, to be to the tune of about $1.4 billion a year. $1.3 billion would go to the states and $97.5 billion for tribes, also a significant feature of this bill. And it would assist efforts to conserve, restore, and protect wildlife and habitat. This is exactly the kind of investment that we crucially need right now. Now, during the hearing on the bill, I raised my concerns about the amount of funding that would go toward threatened and endangered species recovery also about the equity for states with high numbers of threatened and endangered species and whether there were sufficient accountability mechanisms to ensure that this money is being well spent. Uh, I am pleased that the amendment in the nature of the substitute moves us in the right direction on all three of these points. It raises the amount of money that would go toward threatened and endangered species recovery. It adjusts the allocation formula to account for species most critically in need of conservation uh, and improves reporting and accountability. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that while this legislation does take an important step toward addressing our extinction crisis, uh, our work isn't done. We have to continue to work on conservation of our most imperiled species. Federal funding for endangered species recovery has been chronically underfunded for years. And while this bill is great, uh, let's be very clear, it does not fix our chronic ESA underfunding problem and we should have no illusions about that fact. We do have some other bills that can help as well. They're moving through this committee to help fill that gap. Uh, that includes my Critically Endangered Animals Conservation Act, Chairman Grijalva's Extinction Prevention Act, uh, Representative Jeffrey's Salamander Act, and Representative Van Drew's Wild Bird Conservation Reauthorization Act. So uh, again, I want to congratulate Representative Dingle for her great work on this legislation. Look forward to continuing to work with her. Uh, and other colleagues to make sure that wildlife conservation in this country gets the transformational resources that it desperately needs. And I yield back. Mr. Chairman, any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Oh. Mr. McClintock and then Ms. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as has been pointed out, this bill would expand the Pittman, Pittman Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act, which is currently funded by fishing and hunting licenses by an additional $1.4 billion a year authorization taken not from hunters and fishers, but directly taken from taxpayers. You can think of that as about $11 from an average American taxpaying family every year. While the aim is admirable, I think the funding approach is fiscally irresponsible and it sets a terrible precedent for future programs. The Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act, which this bill amends, is based on a successful beneficiary pays principle. It's supported by an excise tax on hunting and fishing licenses, and it's used to restore and maintain hunting and fishing habitats. This approach spares general taxpayers who have no interest in hunting and fishing from bearing the costs of maintaining hunting and fishing lands. Now this legislation would sever that linkage and simply raid the U.S. Treasury for $1.3 billion in perpetuity. And in addition, it adds a new program funded by an annual $100 million authorization to provide for a tribal wildlife conservation account to mirror funding for the state wildlife action plans, but with one important difference. There's no matching requirement. Now, the matching requirement is essential to assure that the entity that receives the funds has demonstrated its own commitment to the project by having its own funds invested in that project. 
Uh, otherwise, it's simply free money, and as we found time and time again, that is the foundation of waste. The bill's proponents obviously recognize how fiscally irresponsible this is, because instead of even a pretense of identifying offsetting cost savings, they've simply exempted themselves from the PAYGO requirements. This is a dangerous attitude to take in an era of chronic trillion-dollar annual budget deficits. The continuing deterioration of our nation's finances might seem to be hidden at the moment behind a solid economic expansion and the House Democrats' impeachment obsession, but I can assure you it is a very real and looming long-term danger to our nation, and it's growing every day in part because of feel-good but fiscally irresponsible measures like this. In short, it means that an average family will pay $11 a, a year in taxes to support a program they have no interest in and get no benefit from. And for those reasons, uh, I'm opposed to the bill. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to express my support to H.R. 3742. This is bipartisan legislation introduced by Representative Dingell and Fontenberry, and I am a proud co-sponsor of the bill. I think this bill will help promote and enhance our nation conservation efforts and ensure the long-term health of fish and wildlife throughout the country. The bill will also provide roughly $1.3 billion annually to help states and territories implement and carry out their state wildlife action plans which identifies specific strategies to restore the population of species of greatest uh, conservation need. It will also provide $97 million annually for tribal fish and wildlife conservation efforts. And I am particularly pleased that this bill includes language to revise the funding allocation formula for Puerto Rico under the Wildlife Conservation and Restoration sub-account. Uh, this provision will ensure I, the island essentially receive state-like treatment, resulting in addition resource, additional resources to help find and fund conservation efforts. This action is consistent with recent bipartisan efforts to ensure territories are treated equally on their various conservation programs. For example, we included language in the public lands package enacted into law early uh, this year to provide state-like treatment to Puerto Rico and the rest of the territories under the Land and, wa and Water Conservation Fund. And in May, this committee passed Congressman Sevlan's H.R. 1809, which ensures we are treated equally under the Pittman, Robertson, and Dingle Johnson programs. I hope we can soon bring that bill, along with my H.R. 1014, the Offshore Wind for Territories Act, to the floor for a vote, as well as H.R. 1225 to restore Park and Public Lands Act. Uh, I want to conclude commending Congresswoman Dingle and Congressman Fontenberry for introducing uh, this bill. And with that, I yield back. Yields, Ms. Howard. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to yield my time to uh, Congresswoman Dingle. Thank you to my colleague. I appreciate, I, I want to speak, first of all, I thank everybody here for working together. And um, I appreciate my colleagues' concern and welcome the opportunity to discuss the fiscal dimensions of this legislation. The resources provided in this legislation are based on the report and recommendations from the Blue Ribbon Panel that I referred to before, a nonpartisan panel representing the outdoor recreation, retail manufacturing set to everybody. This bill would help conserve the full diversity at, of at-risk species, wildlife, fish, and plants. And that's why we use the word species throughout the bill. We're committing to saving all biodiversity. But too few are asking about the cost of inaction. We know that it costs, on average, more than $20 million to save or recover a species after it's been required to be listed under the Endangered Species Act but only a fraction of that if we act earlier. We've already been spending more than $1.5 billion a year to recover listed species because we failed to act before they needed emergency room measures. This bill is built on the premise that an ounce, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Our approach will save federal taxpayers tens of billions of dollars, not to mention creating much more certainty for industry and the growing and growing our massive outdoor economy. Simply put, 
a vote for this bill is a vote for less spend, federal spending long term and more certainty for job creation and more collaboration and less federal regulation. By contrast, a vote against RAWA is exactly the opposite. It's a vote for more federal spending, more impediments to job creation, and much more federal regulation. So with this in mind, I respect my colleagues, but I would urge you to support this bill. And I yield back. Thank you. General. Mr. Radju. Just quickly, I wanted to uh, support Congresswoman Dingell on this legislation. I think it is of extreme importance. I wanted to um, also just say uh, her way of going about this was so methodical, really was so much hard work and so much bipartisanship involved, uh, which I think we could use more and see more of in, in everything that we do uh, in this great house. So I commend her for that the bipartisanship. I commend her for her diligence and her hard work. And thirdly, I very much consider myself as much as I possibly can, whenever I can, a fiscal conservative. But there are some things sometimes that are of such tremendous import that they are more than money. The wildlife diversity that we need to maintain, the uniqueness of this nation and of this world and of the species that exist here, um, to lose them is something that we cannot quantify by the number of dollars that are spent or not spent. It's something that we can't quantify at all. It is something that we have to be all committed to, whether we're Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, I don't really care. Um, this is something that we need to leave for our children, our grandchildren. Um, it's our heritage, it's our posterity, um, is of extreme importance, and I commend you for the work you've done. I yield back. Sablan. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to comment and, um, and thank um, Ms. Dingo, Congresswoman Dingo, for her hard work and dedication in putting together this legislation. I also want to thank um, the Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife for their own participation in getting as much uh, uh, information, testimonies, and helping put together a bill that is reported out and now before us. Uh, not, none of this came easy, but it, the work's good. Uh, superbly grateful for the additional effort towards the territories. Uh, and I want to thank everybody for that consideration as well. So I yield back. Mr. Graves, do you want to be recognized? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to join uh, the chorus of many that uh, have given accolades to the, the gentlelady from Michigan for her um, pretty extensive efforts to try to bring folks together on, on this legislation. Um, uh, the, the, the general lady, along with her, her co-sponsors, have certainly identified a, a priority within this nation in recognition that uh, addressing our wildlife challenges and ensuring that we have appropriate resources dedicated to, to habitat and wildlife management. Um, again, th this, is a, this is a very important area. Um, I, I do have concerns with, with this legislation, though, Mr. Chairman, and the concerns are, are largely related to sort of the accumulation of bills that we've passed out of this committee. Um, we've passed legislation out of this committee that would permanently uh, dedicate $900 million a year to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. We've passed legislation out of this committee that would um, commit $1.4 billion a year for backlog park maintenance. We, uh, under this legislation, would commit another $1.3 billion a year, all of it mandatory spending, as uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia noted earlier, without appropriate prioritization of, uh, of, of annual budget appropriations process, and this bill would do it in, in perpetuity. Um, historically, I've actually been involved in writing bills just like this one, but it was done in a larger package that included something that is really important to the folks that I represent, and, and that is 
uh, parity with revenue sharing so we can sustain uh, the coastal area and communities. Uh, looking at this from a larger lens, uh, we're basically saying that this is more important than the recovery of disasters. And Mr. Van Drew, Mr. Cunningham in, in our district and Mr. Uh, Gomert State in other areas. I, I don't know that I can, I can say that. Uh, that this is more important than recovering from disasters like we've seen in 2016, 2017, 2018, some of the awful disasters that we've had. Um, and, and so that's really challenging uh, for, for me to, 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 to step in and take this on top of these other things that have been uh, progressed through this committee. And at the same time, at the same time, we've passed legislation out of this committee that actually reduces or will prevent future revenues to come in under the jurisdiction of this committee by, by putting moratorium in places uh, where, where those moratorium would expire if uh, under current law. Um, in addition to that, I, I do have a couple of questions that are more drafting related. Um, uh, number one, um, in the in the ANS, um, it looks like under uh, I guess this is three A under three A on uh, on page two and three, it, it establishes a um, uh, the, the, these innovation grants, and it says that you have to have a, a, a group. Composed. I, I'm sorry. The folks can apply for these grants, and it says the group can be uh, composed of uh, the, the applicants can be opposed of different groups, and I assume that means not-for-profit groups. Then further down at the bottom of page three, it, it, it actually establishes a review committee to determine the prioritization of the grant applications, and it says four individuals representing four different nonprofit organizations, each of which is actively participating in carrying out wildlife conservation restoration activities using funds apportioned from the sub account. So it seems like you potentially have a conflict of interest there, and that, that, that probably ought to be addressed as this bill moves forward because you wouldn't want folks applying for money that also were there, um, in fact, a majority, because the review committee only has a state director, the head of the, the, the department responsible for fish and wildlife management in the territory, and then four individuals representing the nonprofit community, so you could potentially have a conflict of interest there. Um, and I'd urge that y'all take a look at that as this bill moves forward, because I'm not under any assumption that this bill's gonna, gonna fail um, in, in passage of this committee. Secondly, on page five, under uh, paragraph C, it, um, it, I do have a question there. It, 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 it appears to provide resources that would, that, that would facilitate the listing of species under Endangered Species Act. And I, I, I know that many members on our side are sensitive to this. While all of us want to ensure that we're recovering species and properly managing them, uh, I, I think that we need to make sure that we're carefully reviewing how that is done. Um, so I, I do have a few amendments to this legislation. I am going to oppose it, uh, not because I object to the goals of the legislation. It largely is a result of the, of the larger concerns I have with not addressing the priorities that, 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 that I have for the people that I represent in terms of the parity with, um, with sustainability for coastal restoration and hurricane protection. Um, uh, but because that has not been brought up by this committee and repeatedly ignored by this committee, and also because the accumulation of dollars under mandatory spending and so I want to thank the woman from Michigan I appreciate her efforts um, but I do uh, urge rejection of this bill and I uh, think it has more work Yield back thank you mr. Graves on the issue of potential conflict uh, be glad to work with you on that clarify that on the issue of the process for listing I don't think so but uh, I uh, is there any is there any further uh, debate before we begin the amendment process? Uh, without objection, the NS offered by myself is considered as read and open to amendment at any point. Representative Graves, uh, sir, you have the First Amendment designated as number one. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what this amendment does is it, um, it simply subjects uh, the funding the $1.3 billion under this legislation uh, to the appropriations process. So it would strike the mandatory spending aspect of this and it would subject it to the annual appropriations process. What this would allow us to do is to work through the annual appropriations process rather than having mandatory spending of $1.3 billion in perpetuity. It would allow us to annually prioritize 
Uh, the funds, I think you're all aware, we currently have a deficit in excess of $20 trillion. And uh, while I do believe that, that wildlife management is a priority, and, and some of the advocates for this legislation have noted that by being proactive in species management in some cases, it can save extraordinary dollars in long-term uh, listing and restrictions associated with the Endangered Species Act. But um, I, uh, in light of my earlier comments about concerns, um, with this committee repeatedly rejecting efforts, bipartisan efforts, uh, to, to address sustainability of coastal Louisiana, one of the, the, the highest producing uh, ecosystems on the North American continent. It, it just seems um, inappropriate that we're moving forward on this one without first addressing uh, uh, what, what I view and what many people in the, um, in the environmental community being one of the highest environmental priorities in this country, uh, the loss of over 2,000 square miles of coastal Louisiana and the powerful uh, uh, habitat and ecological productivity associated with that. And so um, urge adoption of this amendment, which once again, it doesn't, it doesn't kill the bill. Um, all it would do is it would subject uh, this $1.3 billion, which currently is mandatory spending in perpetuity, uh, to an annual appropriations process, and it authorizes the program for five years. Ten, ten years, excuse me, ten years. We're going back and forth uh, for ten years. Yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, anyone? Uh would we'll speak to this. Ms. Dingle and Soto, I think. Ms. Dingle, um, if I may, Ms. Dingle, let me, I apologize, Mr. Soto, I didn't, when you uh, indicated you wanted to be recognized, let me recognize you now, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just br briefly wanted to talk about how critical Recovering America's Wildlife Act is for Florida, uh, the prettiest state in the union, or at least one of them. You know, we have uh, at least one of them. <laughs> we have. As one of our major drivers, fishing, wildlife viewing, boating, scuba diving, hunting, and seafood industry. In fact, many members here have commented about coming to our state on vacation um, because of the beautiful beaches. We host over 100 million visitors a year, and that economy is $42.8 billion, representing 347,000 jobs. And according to our Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, in Florida, we have over 600 species of greatest conservation need, which are in decline or at the risk of becoming imperiled in the future. And so it's so critical to have a state wildlife action plan that, that really has uh, proactive uh, conservation work to help address the needs of Florida's wildlife. Uh, funds for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act would amplify these efforts uh, from, 40, from the current level of 2.3 million to 44.5 million, uh, which is really gonna help long-term. In Florida, this includes uh, critical grants for coral disease outbreak along Florida's reef track, which is the third largest reef track in the world, as well as appreciated endangered species like Florida, manatees, panthers, sea turtles, and gopher tortoises. So I just want to thank Representative Dingle for uh, your leadership on this and uh, looking forward to supporting a very good bill for the Sunshine State. Ms. Dingle, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to be recognized in opposition to the gentleman from Louisiana's amendment. You know, and I would first like to say thank you to all of my colleagues. I did not thank the chair of the subcommittee earlier for all the hard work he's done. And quite frankly, he was more difficult to work with many days than any of the Republicans were. <laughs> for the record. <laughs> but, you know, we, we all work with each other. But... I, I, I have to oppose your amendment. I guess that probably doesn't surprise you. <laughs> a stable funding stream is vital for a successful federal conservation program. Pittman, Robertson, and Dingle Johnson, two of the most historically successful federal conservation programs, have thrived because there's certainty that they will receive predictable, mandatory funding each year. Making RAWA subject to the annual appropriations process will undercut this historically successful formula and prevent long-term planning for conservation projects. I'd also like to note that the Louisiana governor supports this legislation as well, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put his letter of support into the record. Accordingly, I'm sorry, but I have to ask my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Thank you, and I yield back. General, General Lady Yields. Any further uh, discussion on the amendment? Hearing no further debate on the question, the question is now on the Graves Amendment number one. Uh, 
to, to the ANS. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the, the no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Roll call. Gentleman uh, has, uh, has requested a recorded vote, and the vote will be postponed pursuant to prior. Uh, Representative Graves, you have the next amendment designated as number two, and uh, I reserve a point of order. So you ready? No, it needs to be passed up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this amendment uh, pertains to a provision that's in the base text as well as, as in the ANS. And um, it, uh, ironically, is the provision that likely triggered a budget committee uh, referral of, of this legislation, which otherwise may be known as a death sentence. Uh, <laughs> um, what it does is, is highlighting the fact that that under this legislation, uh, we are determining, and, and the, the, the gentlelady from Michigan is right, this is a priority, and, and I do, I, I, your, your comments about providing a stable, um, uh, sort of protected or visible funding stream in the out years, that is, that is, in terms of managing resources, it is a preferable scenario to annual uncertain funding. I agree with you, I, I do, but I, I think that in the Congress, we have to look holistically at, at, at all of our budgetary uh, obligations, needs, and the fact that we are mortgaging our children's future uh, with our, our, our debt now that is in well excess of $20 trillion. And so what this bill does, and in order to circumvent the, the uh, budgetary constraints that, that most legislation faces, is that it waives PAYGO, which would otherwise require an offset uh, for a bill that will be in excess of $25 billion over the next 20 years. Over $25 billion over the next 20 years. Um, and so uh, what this amendment would do is it would strike the PAYGO language, which would require us to look within this committee's allocation to find offsets uh, to ensure that, uh, that we're not driving up the deficit. And I think it uh, perhaps is, a, is an appropriate place for us to, to be considering the fact that we do have a deficit where we are, considering that I think when we look across the board of all the obligations we have in this Congress, adapting to climate change, um, uh, new clean energy solutions, the infrastructure challenges that we have across this country, uh, absurd uh, prescription drug prices, and many, many other things that I think are priorities on both sides of the aisle in this Congress, I think that we should be forced to, to in this case, to look at this within the lens of PAYGO. And, um, and I, uh, I urge adoption of, of the amendment that's getting ready to get killed. <laughs> Gentleman yields back, and, and let me uh, recognize myself. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, amendment offered by Representative Graves to strike the PAYGO language is out, outside this committee's jurisdiction under House Rule 10. However, I do not oppose the amendment on its merits and am committed to working with the gentleman to strike the provision as the bill progresses. Uh, Representative Graves, if, uh, would, if you're willing to uh, withdraw your amendment, uh, the commitment to work on, on uh, striking that language uh, is uh, there. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your willingness to, to work with me. I want to make note that um, there are other instances, maybe or maybe not, in this very markup where we're going to be working on things outside this committee's jurisdiction. Um, I understand your, uh, your, your decision to uh, exercise a point of order at this point in time, and I recognize the fate of this legislation, and if I were to challenge your um, ruling, and so I will withdraw, and I appreciate your effort, or your, excuse me, I appreciate your willingness to work with us as this bill progresses. Yield back. Uh, amendment is withdrawn. Appreciate it, Mr. Graves, and uh, work with you to the end results is to uh, remove that requirement. <laughs> Again, the uh, delayed votes on uh, amendments to HR 2642 uh, and returning to that 
legislation. The question is on the unfinished business. Uh, the amendments to the ANS. Uh, First Amendment designated Westerman number one. Uh, members will record their vote. Uh, voting is now open. Has every member voted? Anyone wish to change their vote? One second, one second, sir. <coughs> we're good? Okay, we're good. Uh, if every, every member has uh, confirmed their vote, uh, the vote is now closed, and if, if the clerk will report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 11 and the nays are 17. The nays uh, have it, and the amendment fails. Second, uh, Westerman uh, Amendment Number Two. Uh, the voting is now open. Has every member voted? Everyone wish to change their vote? If, if not, if every member is confirmed, uh, the vote is now closed, and the clerk will please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 10 and the nays are 17. Uh, the noes have it, the amendment fails. The amendment designated uh, Westerman number four. Uh, the vote is now open. Has every member voted? If every member has confirmed their vote, the vote is now closed and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 10 and the nays are 18. The noes have it, the amendment fails. The question is on uh, the NS amended to HR. The question is on the NS to HR 2642. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the ANS is agreed to. The question is now on adopting uh, HR 2642 as amended and ordered and favorably reported to the House. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and uh, the bill is favorably. Gentleman has requested a recorded vote. Uh, the, qu the question now is the final passage of uh, HR 2642, uh, favorably reported to the House. As amended, member will now record their vote. You're confusing me. Has every member voted? If every member has confirmed their vote, uh, the vote is now closed, and the clerk will please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 18 and the nays are 11. The, the, 
The ayes uh, have Ms. it. The bill is ordered. Mr. Chair, um, make a motion. For okay. The bill is ordered favorably reported. As amended to the House, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Recognize Mr. The Chair, Sir? Uh, under Committee Rule 5C, I give notice of my intention to file an additional or dissenting views on the bill. Just considered and I ask unanimous consent that this notice be extended to all members of the committee and to apply to all bills being considered by the committee today. So ordered. Uh, returning to H.R. 3977, the question is on the unfinished business. The, uh, the vote on the amendment designated as Gomer number one. Uh, the voting is now open. <laughs> Has everyone? Has everyone uh, confirmed their vote, all members? If so, the vote is now closed and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 11 and the nays are 18. The noes have it and the amendment fails. Is that it for that? Mm -hmm. And then final passage, thank you. The question is on a, adopting HR 3977 and ordering it favorably reported to the House. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the bill is ordered favorably. In a chorus of roll call request, uh, uh, the vote, the voting, the motion is on final passage, and the members will record the vote. The, vote, the voting is open. Have all the members confirmed their vote? The voting is now closed and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, in this vote, the yeas are 22 and the nays are seven. The, the ayes have it and the bill is favorably reported to the House. The motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The sit Retur returning to uh, S209, the question is on the unfinished business. Uh, the amendment, which is designated as McClintock number one, and the voting is now open. Has every member voted? If every member's voted. Mr. Lowenthal, Every member's confirmed their vote. Voting is now closed, and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 13 and the nays are 19. The noes have it. The noes have it, and the amendment fails. The question is on adopting S209. And ordering a favor to report it to the House. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The opinion of the chair of the ayes have it. And the board. gentleman asked, request a roll call. The uh, members will record their votes, and the voting is now open.
voted. If every member has confirmed their vote, the vote is now closed, and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 22 and the nays are 10. The yeas have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported to the House, and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Amendments to H.R. 3742. Uh, the question is on the unfinished business to 3742. The, the amendment designated as uh, Mr. Graves number one. The voting is now open. Has every member voted? Does, if every member has confirmed their vote, voting is now closed, and the clerk would please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 11 and the nays are 20. The noes have it, One and the amendment fails. <laughs> the question is on the ANS to <laughs> HR 3742. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the ANS is agreed to. Uh, the question is on adopting HR 3742 as amended and ordering it favorably reported to the House. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the bill is ordered. Mr. Chairman. Roll call has been, been requested. Uh, so the question is on final passage of H.R. 3742. Members will record their votes. Did I? Did I get it? Yeah, you got it. Has... Uh, Every member confirmed their vote. If so, the voting is now closed and the clerk will please report. Mr. Chair, on this vote, the yeas are 26 and the nays are six. The, the ayes have it. The bill is ordered favorably reported to the House and the motion as to recons as amended and the, and the motion is laid on the table for reconsider. We have the UC package. Where is it at? Um, one tab over. Uh, with the cooperation of the ranking member, Mr. Bishop, and other members of the committee, it appears that we have worked out an agreement on five bills scheduled for markup today. Uh, if any mem does any member want to speak to any of the bills in the unanimous consent package? I, I will make, I, as we've done before, I will make a single UC motion to discharge the agreed upon bills. I ask unanimous consent of the subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples of the United States to be discharged for further consideration on H.R. 4957. I ask unanimous consent that the subcommittee on water, oceans, and wildlife. Be discharged for further consideration of H.R. 537-877. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources be discharged for further consideration of H.R. 537. I ask unanimous consent that the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands be discharged for further consideration of H.R. 722 without objection, so ordered. Now I ask unanimous consent that the following bills be adopted and ordered favorably reported as described to the House of Representatives. H.R. 537 with an amendment designated as Lamborn number 9, H.R. 722, H.R. 877, H.R. 4479 with an ANS offered by Representative Sablan, and H.R. 4957 with an amendment designated Gallego 77. Without objection, so ordered. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Where is it? 
All members have two days in which to file supplemental additional minority or dissenting views. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be allowed to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the legislation ordered reported today, subject to the approval of the minority. And I ask unanimous consent that any that for any bill ordered reported today with amendments, that the bill be considered reported with an amendment to strike out all after enacting clause and inserting the text of the bill with its perfecting amendments adopted in committee without objection, so ordered. Are we adjourning? What's this? <laughs> I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Bishop and other members for helping move this markup along. And uh, no further business. We're done. <laughs>